So defence in rugby is complicated. You have so many players on the pitch and every one of them with their own thoughts, opinions and ideas. And so when rugby was first starting out, defending was very individualistic. You of course were working together to try and stop people, but there wasn't that much cohesion and players could either tackle or they couldn't. Which made for some great tries and the game as a whole was very open. But looking back to the footage up to the start of the 2000s, the defensive structures look either non-existent or very outdated indeed. And only very recently has Rugby Union caught up to its league counterpart in terms of defensive organisation. And so the common knowledge of defence in our beautiful game is a little light. But don't worry students, I, your professor, am here to help. So sharpen your pencils, get out your notebooks, and give me your undivided attention please. Let's talk defence. So first up, we must talk about the actual act of tackling someone. Now, there's a lot of debate going on in World Rugby at the moment, with everyone wanting rugby to be a safer game. There's been a lot of pressure on World Rugby to change the height that players are allowed to tackle at, due to the increased awareness of concussion and player safety being paramount. But I'm going to say something that people might find controversial. I think that the tackle height at the moment is fine, as there is a way to tackle up top and it be safe, as well as tackle low and be safe. Side note, in my experience I've had more head injuries tackling low. Anyway, the two ways to tackle someone is a chop tackle and a chest height tackle. Now, I've spoke briefly about the chop tackle in my video on the roll of the back row, but that was more about the basic concept of how it's a lot easier to bring someone down at the legs than up top, which is true. But I didn't really talk about the actual technique of it, so here goes. There's two types of chop tackles. There's the side on one, which is probably the easiest to get your head around in terms of actual difficulty. Well, in theory, anyway. What you do is, as the attacker is going past you on the outside, you get your leg in close and get your shoulder to hit whichever one of the defender's legs is closest to. And you can hit at whatever height you feel comfortable. I would suggest for newbies, around the mid-thigh range, as if your hit isn't hard, you can just slide down their leg to the ankles and you will get them down anyway. But expert defenders will probably go as low as possible, either below the knee or in some cases straight ankles, both to avoid the fend, but also to get the person down quicker. As it's pretty shocking for someone when they're running and someone just chops their ankles. And that's basically it. Oh wait, I forgot the biggest thing. Get your head on the right side. This is where the game can get dangerous, and even pros get this wrong sometimes. Your head must, must be on the side behind the defender. This is so you don't get a big old knee to your temple. If you're tackling with your right shoulder and he's going past your right side, get your head on the left. We will get onto this in every type of tackle technique, but this is the most important thing about tackling. Get your head in a safe place and then think about your shoulder. When I play, I just think about where my head goes before I even think about making the tackle. You might sacrifice a bit of ground or even miss the tackle in some cases, but you will be alive and your brain won't be internally bleeding from a second row's big old right knee saying konnichiwa to your temple. Now onto the second type of chop tackle. Front on. Now, front on chops over the years have got a little bit more passive, as before, if you were going low on someone running straight at you, you were probably looking to dump tackle them. But the need for people not to be dropped on their head in a moment of either stupidity or redness rage has seen the dump tackle fall out of fashion in the rugby world, and it's been replaced with these more passive front on chop tackles where an attacker is running at his opponent and the defender comes up and takes the space but then stops, allowing the attacker to run over them, but as they go over they are tripped either just because of the speed bump in their path or the more likely option, the defender grasps the attacker's ankle as they go over them. And this method of tackling may not be the best for bringing physicality or sending people backwards, but it does get people on the ground very quickly as the faster the attacker is going, the faster they're going to fall over. And it's a method of tackling that I both endorse and recommend, especially for smaller players on the rugby field. And make sure you get your head on the right side. Now this is harder on front tackles, but what you have to do is use your footwork to get yourself in a position so the attacker is running at whichever shoulder feels natural. Then you get your head the hell out of the way of his legs, into the space. I will not stop repeating myself about this. Concussions are real, and you need to make this contact sport as safe for yourself as you can. Now, if the chop tackle is as effective as I say it is, which it is, listen to everything I say, don't have your own opinions, mine are better, then why would any other type of tackle be necessary? Well, that may be a vision of the future, but at the moment there is a good reason for the use of the next type of tackling. The mid-range, slash going up top, slash man test, slash the most physical type of tackle. Now, that last word, physical, that's the key word with this type of tackle, if it's front on. So, forwards in rugby have my eternal respect for the work they do on the pitch, and just how painful rugby must be for them. Another reason why I respect their role in rugby is the type of tackles they have to make. 
as a lot of it is just mano a mano who's stronger contest. But in GJ, why don't they just always chop people to avoid the pain in defense? Well, I'm glad you asked, whining child. The reason that tackles like this have to be made by the front five constantly is because dominance of the game line in rugby is the simplest way to gain momentum in rugby. And taking on someone mano a mano and coming out on top is not only advantageous in terms of momentum for your team and sending them backwards, but mentally it gives you a massive edge and gets people's backs up. And the mental warfare in rugby is half the battle and any advantage you get is a massive difference. But again, you must be safe and get your head on the right side. This type of tackle is where you can really hurt yourself as you're hyped up and you feel like you're about to run through a wall and technique just goes out of the window. Get your head and your feet right, then melt someone. Also, as a side note, the combination of, the, of two players doing these two different types of tackle at the same time is a thing of beauty. One going low, one going high, and sending a big man backwards. Delicious. Now, the high tackle or the mid-range is a bit of a weird one, as most coaches just shout at you for doing it, saying, Go low, you clown! He's too strong to go high on! And to that I say, most of the time, yeah. You're right, but I as a person should never be spoke to and talked to in that way, you dick. Anyway, going low on people in most cases is usually a safe bet, especially if they're running away from you and not at you. Except for when you have mastered the pat down. Ooh, what's the pat down? Why is a pat down? Who is a pat down? All these questions I will answer, sweet peas. So the technique of a pat down is something that, according to the rumor mill, was either created or borrowed by Sean Edwards at his time it was, to give to one of the few English players that Southern Hemisphere people know about, Danny Cipriani, who was a young fly half with oodles of potential skill and was already had a good 10 at the time so they wanted to play him at fullback. And I actually made a documentary about him and his journey, you should totally go check it out. Why have you not subscribed to me yet? But the one deficiency he had in this game holding him back was that he wasn't the best tackler and didn't really like going low, and still doesn't to this day. But the pat down technique meant that he didn't have to go low, as whenever someone would try and fend him, he would simply pat down the fend with one arm and then hit them with the other arm and shoulder. And as proof of how effective this is, here is Alessana Tuolangi in his prime in full flight being tackled by an 18 year old Danny Cipriani. And another reason I'm such a fan of this type of tackle is because sometimes when certain people are in full flight, even if you go low, there's no stopping them. They're moving too fast and they're too strong and they have too much momentum to be stopped, which is a cold, hard, unfortunate fact. But with this technique, even the biggest dude will at least fall off balance slightly, as when you go to fend someone, you lean in, and patting down the fend naturally makes someone leaning in less stable. Often they're falling before you even have made the tackle, and that's what I mean by there being safe ways to tackle high. The issues the game of rugby union is having around head collisions aren't about tackle high, they're about technique and people not taking care of themselves or their opponents. As if you lower the tackle high, attackers are just going to start putting their arms and elbows lower to try and protect themselves and win collisions, and you're going to have the same problems except now there's more chance of people getting a knee in the head too. So the key point to remember from all this is technique above all else is key then have fun being the crap out of each other. So now we move on to the actual structures that teams use to combine all this knowledge and wisdom into some form of organized chaos. Now, the first thing you need to know is rugby's defensive structures at the elite level are so abhorrently complex that it deserves its own video. But what I wanted to discuss with you now is the basic principles that these complicated defenses are trying to use. You dig? Good. So the two main ways of playing defense as a team are to blitz or to go up and out. The blitz is where your team get on the outside shoulders of the attackers and then come in on them with the widest guys getting the highest up the field to try and shut down attackers going wide to their danger men, keeping the game physical and tight. The up and out is the opposite, with the teams having the inside men as the highest defenders and you get off the line to shut down the space of the opposition but once they go wide you slide across and have your defenders drift together to try and make the tackle. Now both styles have their advantages and disadvantages, the blitz is the most aggressive and in your face and allows loads of opportunities to catch teams on the back foot, whilst also being easy to teach to players in a short amount of time, which is why the Lions often use it on tours because they have a short amount of time to get ready for these high level test matches. Also the simple fact that shouting to players get off the line and make hits is something most players and people at that level can get behind. However this style is extremely tiring and unless you have complete buy in from your whole team at all times it falls apart, as well as the fact that if your team can get around the blitz defence or inside balls you're basically either completely screwed or you concede a hell of a lot of ground, but that's the risk you take 
stick with it. Now, if we contrast that with the more conservative up and out, yes, you lose more ground on most players individually than you would if you were blitzing, but there is a way lower risk of actual line breaks, as instead of doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one defending like you would in a blitz, you're defending as a pack only as fast as your slowest man sliding across, and it's way less taxing on the body for players, as you can hide tired players or slow players by either keeping them in the middle of the park or just telling them to corner flag and covering their inside. And the downsides for this style are, like I said, more ground conceded as well as the fact that if players miss tackles that they should make through lapses of concentration, which do happen as in the system you just feel very safe then you're screwed. But the best defences in my opinion are the all-around defences that do both and more. The ones who allow the on-field player to make decisions depending on who and what's in front of them. For example, if you're an individual in a team that's using this system, you have three options. Blitz, go up and out, or go soft. Now Blitz I've already explained, go up hard, make tackles, but in this system you only do it if you either have the same amount of numbers in the defence as the attackers, or more. Makes sense? Get up, shut them down. You also do it when you're on your own line, as there's no point in drifting or going soft, as by the time you make the tackle in this area, despite the fact you probably won't miss it, the opposition will just make too much ground and score anyway. Also in recent years, teams have started blitzing a team when they get to the touchline, as it's very difficult and time consuming to get to the other side of the pitch from that position, so teams will try and fly up and take the space. Now onto the other one we've come across, the up and out. This is for when you're slightly down on numbers in defence, maybe one or two, so you go up and and if they just hit up, that's fine, you've got off the line and they don't make too much ground. But if they go wide, the defence slides along and then they make the hit somewhere in the 15 metre channel. No dramas. This is for emergencies only, as the basic premise of it is to buy time for your team to help you out because you are effed. I'm talking five on one. One of you, five of them. And what you do is you go almost diagonally running backwards and conceding ground, using your lack of commitment to con the defenders either into going wide too soon, which is easier for you to defend, or buying enough time so that the ball carrier holds onto the ball for too long and one of your inside defenders can tackle him. Try and usually do it far away from your own try line as there's no point when you're in your own 22. And the best defences in the world try and combine all the best bits of everything that I've just talked about and remove the weaknesses, which is a task that I do not envy. And that's where we're going to leave it for now. Sorry to talk so much about the real hip and cool subject of safety, but I want people to love this game and for it to grow. But it can't do that if people aren't taking care of themselves and each other. I hope you enjoyed. Signed, NGJ.